This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. Our topic today is a disease known as ALS, and I'm gonna look down to make sure I get this right, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. To get us through this topic, we have with us a true world's expert, Dr. Jeff Sheehan, welcome. Thank you. Dr. Sheehan is a professor of neurosciences here. He is the director of the neuromuscular division at UCSD and co-director of the ALS clinic. So welcome. Um, I, I said it right, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You did, perfect. Good, I'm not gonna say it again. I'm gonna say ALS. ALS is fine. Um, and, and I think people have probably heard of this more like as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, but I'm not sure people actually understand at all what ALS is. So can you just sort of take us through how, nor how normal muscle works and how the normal interaction between neurons and the brain and muscle is and then what goes on in ALS that changes. Oh yes, of course. Well, normally when you want to make a movement, it starts in the brain. There's an area of the brain called the motor cortex which initiates a, an impulse traveling down through the brain, the brain stem, down the spinal cord where it connects to another nerve which travels out to the muscle, and with that connection, you can make a movement. So you make a decision, voluntary or not, I'm gonna move my hand, it moves. It, yes, exactly. And those two systems, the upper one that goes from the brain to the spinal cord is called the upper motor neuron, and the one that leaves the spinal cord and goes to the muscle is the lower motor neuron. And then in ALS, this doesn't work right. Uh, yes, that's right. Typically, both of those systems start to break down. It could begin with the upper or with the lower or sometimes with a mixture of each. But eventually, in the true full-blown ALS, both systems are deteriorating. The name of the disease itself, the ALS, um, it, it, it's sort of interesting because the, the muscles, there's nothing particularly wrong with the muscle. Yes, that's right. It's not the muscle itself that's the problem. But yet the muscle deteriorates. Yes, it does, because it loses its lower motor neuron connection, and once that connection is lost, the muscle shrinks and shrivels. Why? We don't really know, but it's probably because the nerve connection itself is feeding the muscle something which tells it that it still has a connection. When that connection is lost, that trophic factor, which is probably what it is, is no longer present for that muscle, and so it shrivels up and uh, and dies. It's almost like if you don't use it, you lose it. I mean, this is uh, yes, very much, and uh, it uh, occurs in all nerve injuries to some extent. So slowly, progressively, the uh, your your muscles aren't working not because your muscles fail, but because they're not being told what to do. Exactly, um, and and you know I, I can imagine somebody sitting at home thinking, does this happen? to many people, is it rare? And I think I have my numbers right, that we're talking about about 5,600 people a year diagnosed, and at any given time, there's about 30,000 Americans who have, are alive with ALS. Yes, that's, a, that's about right. Um, that's a fairly significant number of people who have a pretty serious disease. Yes, it is, but it's not as common as some of the other well, better known diseases like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's. So, the general public doesn't really know a lot about it. From, if you're a patient, you're somebody at home just hanging out and you're wondering, how would I ever know if I had ALS? And, and what would be the beginning signs and does it matter if, if I know, if I figure, find this out? Well, I think it certainly matters if you do find out what's causing your symptoms because it could be something serious. 
it could be something very simple and benign as well. So there's really not um, a lot of need to panic if you if you notice something and you get onto the internet and then suddenly Lou Gehrig's disease pops up as a possible cause of that. I mean, there are lots of different explanations for many symptoms, but the disease could begin in in ways that are very, very different depending on what part of the body starts to suffer first. So the variety of presenting symptoms is rather is rather great actually and it does sometimes lead to a, a, a delay in making the diagnosis because it is so variable in its presentation and often fairly subtle and slow. So, so why don't we run through some of those and, and recognizing that many of these overlap with regular stuff that happens to all of us all the time. Absolutely, and, yes. And, and not to panic and go to Dr. Internet and Dr. Google and ask them their opinions, yes. but, but to the idea that, that these are the early beginnings uh, and, and they progress. Yes, yes. Well, probably the, the first symptom to, to discuss in, in this context is uh, are known as fasciculations, which are very small twitches of a part of the muscle. It's not the whole muscle contracting, but just a little, feeling a little pop in, in a muscle. And this is a normal occurrence in normal people. Everyone has at some time had at least one of those experiences. Now, sometimes they can get a little bit more active and it is often, most often in fact, perfectly benign. It's just a sign of an overactive nervous system. So, but unfortunately, those fasciculations, those little muscle twitches, have a very strong association with ALS. And unfortunately, it's almost the first thing that pops up on the internet when you type in muscle twitches, fasciculations, and then people panic. So, but that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, it's do rather you, uncommon. Sorry, do you get people coming to your office because they did that? Yes, yes, absolutely. I have a lot of people, um, famously, as you know, medical students uh, or, or experience this for the first time of the stress, but it does happen. And uh, if they find this out, they start to panic because they think they've got Lou Gehrig's disease. I do a huge amount of reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's value to that, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And it's, uh, it's very nice because we can reassure people a lot of the time and in fact I have to say probably I have never encountered a case of ALS that has presented with just these fasciculations as the problem it is almost the reverse they don't complain about those so much it's other things that they complain about right so the fasciculations start people either over worry about it or kind of ignore it and then more things begin to happen Yes, well, the overworry is a good point because if you do overworry and get anxious about it, it makes those twitches worse, and they're just even more convinced. So, stay yes. calm. <laughs> yes. So, but now time goes by, and and is there a time typical time course? There is a kind of a typical time course, or, or the median, which is the sort of middle ground of how fast or how slow it can go, and that is around about three years or so. So, it's. Uh, fast by some standards, but it can go much longer than that. So there are patients, for instance, who have gone 10, 15 years. The famous physicist Stephen Hawking would be an excellent example of someone who has had it for 40, almost 50 years. There are some very rapid ones as well. Uh, they tend to be more the uh, familial ones, the very rare genetically inherited types but we're generally talking about progression over several years, roughly. And, and as long as you brought it up, there, there seems to be, as, as I read it, there's three types. There's the, this familial, five to 10% maybe, right. uh, and then there's the sporadic type, and then there's this group in Guam, which uh, I don't quite get, but. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Well, the, firstly, yes, as you say, the familial ones, the, the inherited forms are quite uncommon, maybe one in 20 cases, roughly. Most of the others, excluding Guam, are sporadic, which is to say they just appear from nowhere. And the Guam cases are very similar in type to ALS, but actually they're pathologically a little bit different. They look very, very similar, and that's thought to be something toxic that they're eating. Uh, this has been a long going problem trying to work out what is causing this sort of thing. They also get uh, sort of a dementia and Parkinsonism sometimes too. Uh, but it's 
gone full circle, initially thought it was something toxic in their diet, and then it changed to other things, and now they're coming back to thinking they're eating something or cooking something in a way that causes something toxic to their nervous system. So, and, and then that takes us to risk factors that uh, we think of here in the United States. The, the group of people that we're talking about are typically between 40 and 70? Yes, uh, typically so, but uh, it can strike pretty much any age after about um, 15 or so. Those are more likely the younger ones, that is, to be the familial forms. So the younger patients, we often worry about that, that the, it's a genetic yeah. thing. But it can be sporadic in the 30s as well. And, and you're, you're pre-entering health. Uh, we think of Lou Gehrig. I mean, here's this big strapping professional athlete. Uh, I have a friend of mine who's a triathlete who uh, developed ALS. That's not the issue. That, I mean, the, how, what you're doing beforehand in terms of your overall health doesn't seem to be causative in some way or other. It doesn't seem to be, that's correct. And in fact, it's striking that most of the patients that I've seen with ALS have been very, very healthy people up until that point. It's not as though they've been having diabetes and hypertension and then all sorts of troubles and then finally ALS pops up. They're generally very, very healthy people. This is the first significant illness they've ever had in their lives. They're, the question about whether physical activity has anything to do with it has come up because of a statistically higher incidence in soccer football players in Europe, uh, particularly in Italy. Now, they're also now, hitting... if they play proper football, oh, it would be much better. Right, they, with they their would helmets be better and everything. Yes, yes exactly. no, But they're hitting those balls with their heads. <laughs> and, uh, so it does raise this question about, you know, if you do a lot of physical activity, are you somehow stressing your motor system and this is bringing it on? Hmm. It's, there's absolutely no physical evidence that that's the case, uh, but it's, it's, it's a thought, and it is striking that most people are very healthy and fairly active as well up until that point. Um, so, fasciculations start in, in this average sort of 40 to 70 year old person who's been reasonably healthy before. They don't panic about it, but then what, what happens after the fasciculations? Right, well, the, the first manifestation is some something that has to do with weakness of certain muscles. So that could be something simple like a hand muscle or some weakness in the legs or leg. But it could also affect speech as well. And speech might start to get a little slurred or a little slow. Uh, they might have some difficulty forming certain words rather than others. Maybe even difficulty swallowing too if those muscles in the head and neck are the first to be affected. So it would be typically one of those types of presentations, difficulty chewing, swallowing, speaking, fatigue of the voice as well, getting tired, maybe weakness in an arm or a leg, it, but it could also present with a, a sort of a stiffness as well. It might present with just um, walking stiffly in one leg or one leg getting tired rather than actually weak. So I have most of those symptoms. Oh, well. The, not, and, and, and it seems like, you just described aging. Yes. Right? I mean, you know, you get a little bit weaker than you used to be. You search for a word. You, maybe you stumble. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, my knee hurts me, so that leg doesn't feel as good. But th this is still now a steady progression. So I'm assuming that now with the onset of what you've just described, fasciculations, the onset of what you described, the swallowing, the speech, that seems to be a little bit more than just aging. Yes. So that seems to be a red flag. Now people do start to show up to you, right? Yes, absolutely. And it is one of the more common presentations as the first uh, uh, event is this difficulty with chewing, swallowing, speaking. Because it stands out as being somewhat different than just normal aging or other... Precisely, events. yes. Um, but, but there are other things that can cause that. So you're going to separate these out. You're going to start testing people in, in various different ways to separate out things that look like each other what we would call a differential diagnosis. Yes. And then you're gonna make a diagnosis perhaps of ALS. H how does that process work? And, and then how do you arrive at ALS? Well, uh, you have to, of course, have the possible suspicion of that as a diagnosis. And if that is your main suspicion, based upon the history and the results of the physical examination, then that creates a list of alternative possibilities for, for every aspect of it. And it will usually require a combination of lots of blood tests 
and an electrical study of the nerves and muscles. Usually also MRI scans are needed because common things that mimic this are simple degenerative spine disease, for instance, in the neck or the lower back, something like that. So we have to see whether there's a fairly ordinary explanation for everything that's going on. And, and in med school, they taught us common things occur commonly. That's right. <laughs> and yes. so, so these symptoms have much more common routine causes before you get to ALS. Yes, exactly. So yes. you're really crossing things off the list. Yes, it is a process of elimination, absolutely, because unfortunately, right now, we don't have what we would call a positive test for it. We can't run the ALS test and have it come back positive. So we have to exclude all the other things that it could be that could be treated. And there are many of them, in fact. So we work very hard to, to make sure we're not missing anything that's readily treatable. And if at the end of a rigorous and very thorough investigation, there seems to be no other explanation, then we might put a patient down as having probable or even definite if it, if it is that strong. What do you tell a patient? What, what, what do you say to them when you're looking at them and go, I think, I think you have ALS? I mean, what, how does that conversation go? That's very tough. That is, that is one of the hardest things to do. Um, if I'm seeing the patient for the very first time, for instance, if they're have, they haven't seen another neurologist before they come to see me, that's even tougher because often the other neurologist will have brought up that possibility. They won't necessarily say that's what you have because it really is one of those diagnoses that requires, it's almost standard to have at least two neurologists agree on the diagnosis because it is so devastating to get this news. So they're often a little bit primed with this possibility. Um, but when I'm telling them for the first time, I, uh, I approach it very, very carefully, and very empathically informing them that, that they have what appears to be a neurodegenerative disease of the Lou Gehrig's ALS type. And I explain that we, as yet, unfortunately, don't have a cure for that, but there is a lot that we can do. I need to accentuate that there's a lot of, there are positive aspects to this, by which I mean we can help an awful lot to improve quality of life. They're usually with family members, and in my experience, the family members are the ones that take it harder. The patients themselves have often had an inkling that something like that was going on, that they, it doesn't usually come as a complete surprise to them, strangely enough, even if they haven't seen someone else to suggest that possibility to them. But this is not something I can tell them on the first visit because I have to go through a lot of additional testing. I do tell them that it's one of the possibilities and that it might even be the actual diagnosis. But we have a recurring series of visits and it may be the third visit or so by the time we get all the testing done but we've seen uh, them again to look at the results of their scans, blood tests, and the EMG and things. So we've been mulling this process and the diagnosis has been sort of settling in over time. And then, but finally we do have to come down and say, this is what I think you have. The developing of that relationship between you and the patient seems like it's core in your ability to be able to help take care of them. Yes, absolutely. It's very important to have a, a good rapport with the patient because you may be giving them some terrible news uh, down the line and not just to deliver the news but to help manage that as well. You do need to have a very close relationship with them uh, because you are effectively going to be helping manage their condition, manage their lives as they are slowly dying. The, the there are things that you can do, though, to sort of help. Um, yes. And uh, um, care intervention matters. Absolutely. Uh, and, and intervention with occupational therapists and some of the, the other things that are available can make a big difference in the quality of their life. And even, I was surprised by this, but it made sense when I was reading preparation to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Preparation for um, learning how you're going to speak 
or uh, alternative ways or using technology before all this happens so that as it happens you're ready. Yes, that's right. And it's a big part of the process that we go through with our ALS clinic. We have a multidisciplinary clinic where all of the required people attend, the occupational therapist, speech therapist, social worker, everyone that the patient and their family might need is all there in the one spot. And we aim for early intervention. There is a, a strong tendency often to put these things off until it's too late almost. But we want to think about these things, have these conversations early so that the patients and their family are thinking about them. It might not be required right then and there, but they really need to think about things like how they will communicate. Do they want to have perhaps a, a feeding tube inserted when they can't swallow? Do they want to have ventilation if their breathing muscles get weak? These are not the decisions you want to make on the spot and, and at the last minute either, because it can be more dangerous to, say, have a tube inserted when you can't breathe properly. So these things we like to get the conversation going early and actually do the intervention often before it's actually needed but in preparation for it so the patient can get used to, say, having a feeding tube that's not being used right now, but they're getting used to it being there, taking care of it, and then when the time comes to start using it a little, and not necessarily all at once, it's a gradual change, then they're more comfortable with it. It's hugely valuable to be at a center that has all of these resources in one spot so the patient doesn't have to try and collect it on their own. Yes. Uh, and and, and it's, it's very obvious that way for support system. Now, Patients want solutions. Yes. We don't know exactly the cause, and you've just, we've described sort of palliative therapy to, to help enhance quality of life as we're going along. What about what people typically think of as treatment? Uh, you know, treatment, yes. Fix me, doctor, right? And yes. What's out there currently that can be offered to a patient? And then I want to talk to you about some of the stuff that the labs here at UCSD are working on and some of the things that are going around that, that maybe help promise. Yes, well, it has been unfortunate that over a very long period of time, many, many treatments have been tried and, and, not, and not worked. The only one that's currently available is a, a medication called Riluzole. Uh, brand name is Rilutec. Uh, some people might know it by that. And that has, a, I would think, a modest or fair benefit, which is to say that in the studies at least, it only prolonged survival by about three months or so in a, a roughly average three years. Now, three months is not a long time, but for somebody that might be worth it. You might see your daughter get married. Yes, it, yes, it, it, it could buy you a little extra value. time yeah. for that. But the thing is, we don't know if it's gonna make you last, uh, survive longer than the average person, because again, these are just trials that are looking at usually the very more advanced forms of ALS in order to be sure that you have ALS, you are generally going to be more advanced and therefore be you're in that trial. Late. You're getting it later. Right. We're starting it earlier. The problem is we don't know. It's, not, it's like taking vitamins in a way. You don't know if it's helping you. It might be slowing things down, but you can't really tell. So you kind of take it a little bit on faith and if it doesn't make you sick, it's not toxic really, but if it doesn't upset your stomach or something, then it's probably worth taking that chance that it is healthy. Well, given that concept, and in medicine we see this all the time, when there's no real treatment we can offer, people start thinking the way you just did, which is, if it doesn't make you sick, maybe you should try it. There must be patients that are reaching all over for complementary medicine or for faith healing or for anything. Go to Russia and get something done. Go to China and get something done. Absolutely right, yes. W what do we say to them? Well, um, I usually play up the safety angle here because the things that they're going to have done are not safe necessarily. So we're talking about chelation therapy, for instance, which can leach a whole lot of things out of your blood that you don't want. Stem cells even that are being injected into your nervous system or into your circulation. These things are not without risk. And not to mention, they're often tremendously expensive. There's no scientific basis for these things. So they're going, the patients are going on a hope, often with false promises, I'm sad so to say. In some ways, they're being taken advantage of. 
It certainly looks that way. I would like to believe that perhaps some of these doctors are doing it in good faith, but I strongly suspect, as we have seen with cancer therapy, there are people out there who will take advantage of this, of a desperate patient. Now, alternatively, some of the same words you used, stem, stem cell therapy, gene therapy, we're studying that here in, at UC San Diego yes. uh, w through your department, et cetera, where there may be a hope to stop normal cells from getting worse or maybe eventually arrest the process, change it. Th that's exciting, but that's under very rigorous scientific terms. Tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. Yes, no, it is, you're absolutely right. It's very exciting, and we are very fortunate at UCSD to have some of the world's leading researchers in just this very problem. And they've recently been given a grant to study stem cell treatment for this condition. And they have a very optimistic and very hopeful but very aggressive deadline to have this available for clinical trials in a few years. They need to go through the animal studies first, of course, to make sure it's safe and it's actually effective. But the stem cell idea is, as you said, first to try and protect the nerves from further damage. So they're not aiming to make new nerve cells that will connect to the muscles again. That's, that's a bit more in the future probably. What they think is that they can create with stem cells more better support cells around the nerve. So the nerve itself is supported by a number of different other nerve types cells and they're hoping that if they can replace those or add to those more normal ones then it will help the survival of that particular motor nerve and so ideally slow it down better stop it from progressing Reversing it, that may be more difficult. Boy, stopping from progressing would be a huge victory at this point. Absolutely, and if we can do that, then the onus will be on us to make this diagnosis early, as early as possible, so we're not arresting something just short of, of, death. of death. Yeah, or, or that's, uh, but, but the, even the capability of having this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, when I was in med school, or even five years ago, that's science fiction. Oh, absolutely right. Now we're talking about you have a grant for it here, mm -hmm. and that we're actively working on it. Um, I can't think of anything more encouraging to, to sort of tie up the show with. Well, absolutely. I think it's the most promising treatment by far, because it really gets at protecting the nerve itself. And everything else is tried with similar kinds of approach, but that focus on protecting the nerve with this stem cell idea is very, very, uh, very, very hopeful. Of course, we, we have to go through all the steps to make sure that it's safe and it is actually effective, but we have top people working on it. Don Cleveland, for example, is internationally renowned for his work in this field. So patients would be better off searching out a center like UC San Diego where this research is going on than dumping money into potentially unsafe approaches uh, and, and be a part of these trials, be a part of developing the answers uh, rather than throwing money away or potentially making their own, taking their own health into uh, danger. Yes, no, I think they're absolutely right. The, the concept of the multidisciplinary clinic has been studied and shown that it does actually enhance survival. So being in a multidisciplinary clinic will extend your life and quality of life as well. That's been absolutely shown. And if I, God forbid, would have ALS, I would definitely want to be in a place where the next most promising treatment is being developed so that I could you know, take advantage of that possibility, or if not, at least contribute to you know, testing something which is, is safe and possibly effective as well. So I would, uh, that would certainly be, be my recommendation. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Well, you know, we say it all the time here on Health Matters, and that is that knowledge is power. Uh, this is a difficult disease we've been talking about, but the fact is that there are many things that you can do to help yourself along the way by being at a center, by getting really good information, by having an expert like Dr. Jeff Sheehan to talk to at a multidisciplinary center. You can prolong your life. You can extend the quality of your life and maybe be a part of the solution. I'm Dr. David Granite. This has been Health Matters, and we'll see you again next time.